Hey, it's John from Adults Have Toys 2. So I'm back, and instead of doing a skit this time, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who subscribed. When I made the last video, I was at about 190 subscribers, and I was hoping to hit 200, but you guys took me over 250 subscribers. That is absolutely amazing. Hey, Editor John, interrupting Presenter John for a moment, just to say that in the last couple of days since I filmed that, I actually added almost 120 more subscribers, so uh, I, I don't know what to say. I am so thankful for everybody who watched the videos that I have and felt it was worthwhile enough to subscribe to come back and watch some more. So again, thank you, thank you so, so much. You done? Wait, what? Come on, stop talking about yourself. No, no, I'm, I'm thanking them. It's, it's not about me. Yeah, I'm, they're here to see the content, so let's get to the content. Okay, you're right. You're here for the content, so let's get started. Hey, like I said, it's John from Adults Have Toys 2. So, I've been using the S21 Ultra for the past few weeks, and I'll say the standout feature by far is the telephoto abilities packed into such a small package. But let's be real, it's still a cell phone camera with cell phone sensors and cell phone lenses. There's no way that it can compete with a real camera, right? I rounded up a couple of real cameras and another phone to compare and see if we can answer this question that comes up every year. Can I replace a standalone camera with my phone? And every year, the answer is pretty much the same. Yes, but actually no. The quality of phone cameras have improved by leaps and bounds in recent years, and even cheap cell phones can produce images that stand up well on social media. And as the saying goes, the best camera is the one that you have on you, and no camera will be with you more than the one that's in your pocket. Another thing you'll see hundreds of videos on YouTube saying is, gear doesn't matter. It's all about the photographer as, of course, they stand in front of thousands of dollars worth of cameras and lenses and lights. So first, the roundup. If you really don't care about the details, go ahead and skip over here or check the bookmarks below and skip over to the results. But if you like the little details, stick around. So let's take a look at the contenders. First up against Samsung's latest and greatest is a mirrorless, interchangeable lens camera launched in 2020, the Fujifilm X-T4. That's what you're watching me on right now. Next is a five-year-old high-end point-and-shoot camera, the Panasonic Lumix ZS100. And then to round out the test and kind of act as a control is a phone equally as old as that Panasonic, the Galaxy S6. So rather than just spit out all the specs at you, let's break it down into the important components. First up, the sensor. Photography is the art of capturing light. And in digital photography, the final resting place of that light is the sensor. In this group, we have a huge variety of sensors. The main thing that we're looking for is the size of the sensor, which affects how much light it can collect, and the number of pixels, which affects how much detail the sensor can theoretically pick up. So let's start with the smallest sensor, which is in the Galaxy S6. It's a 16 megapixel, one over 2.6 inch sensor that's backside illuminated, which is a fairly recent innovation that moves the electronics away from the light sensing portion of the sensor. Going forward, just note that the sensor sizes in inches really has no bearing on the actual size in inches. It's based on an old vacuum tube standard, so I'll put a diagram here to help you visualize the differences in sizes that we're talking about. Moving up in sensor size is the S21 Ultra, with a much larger main sensor at 1 over 1.33 inch, with a crazy amount of pixels at 108 megapixels. Though in normal use, it will collect it together in bundles of 9 pixels, and you'll end up with a 12 megapixel image. But that's not the only sensor this phone is rocking, not by far. There's also a 1 over 2.55 inch sensor with 12 megapixels for the ultra wide camera, which is about the same size as the Galaxy S6's main sensor. And there are also two 10 megapixel sensors for the telephoto lenses, both of them at 1 over 3.24 inches, which is a very tiny sensor. They will also both output 12 megapixel images from the 10 megapixel sensor for some reason, so there's definitely some computational trickery going on. The next largest is our first step into the real cameras with the Panasonic ZS100. Here we move away from the fractions of an inch to a full one inch sensor at 20 megapixels. It'll be interesting to see how moving up sensor sizes will affect the image, especially considering that this sensor uses an older non-backside illuminated sensor. Last up is the Fujifilm with a 26 megapixel APS-C size sensor. This is much bigger than anything else we have here and is one of the markers that separate a professional level camera. Despite how much this sensor dwarfs the other sensors here, 
In the photography world, this is considered a crop sensor, cropped down from full frame, or the size of 35mm film. Fujifilm doesn't make any full frame cameras, but they do make a medium format camera. Medium, of course, meaning considerably larger than full. And, and don't get me started on micro four thirds. The other important part we're looking at is the lenses that are in front of those sensors. One of the main specs we're worried about here is the focal length, which determines the field of view of the camera. Now, bigger sensors mean bigger lenses. So without getting in too deep here, I'll quote things in 35 millimeter or full frame equivalent so we can compare the field of view between the different size sensors. The other main spec is aperture. There's some math that I'm not gonna get into here, but the long story short is the lower the number, the wider the opening. Therefore, more light gets in. So starting back again with the Galaxy S6, it has a 28 millimeter equivalent focal length with an aperture of f1.9, which is a wide-ish view with a very wide open aperture. Both of these figures are fixed. The S21 Ultra lets you pick between a few different focal lengths, all with fixed apertures. The widest is the ultra wide in front of the 12 megapixel sensor that comes in a 13 millimeter equivalent focal length and an f2.2 aperture. So that's a very wide angle lens with a fairly wide open aperture. Next up is the main camera in front of that 108 megapixel sensor. That comes in still quite wide at 24 millimeter equivalent focal length with a very bright aperture of f1.8. Next is the two 10 megapixel sensors with telephoto lenses in front of them. One has a 70 millimeter equivalent with an f2.4 aperture and the other a very narrow 240 millimeter which has a relatively dim aperture of f4.9 which may come into play later. The terms three times and 10 times in the marketing doesn't really mean anything on its own. It's all based on how they compare to the main 24 millimeter sensor. So 240 millimeter being 10 times that. Now moving into the world of real cameras, things get a bit more complicated. The Panasonic has a built-in zoom lens. This lens can change from the equivalent of 25 millimeters all the way out to 250 millimeters, which is why it says 10 times zoom on it. And this range is quite close to the range that the S21 Ultra has minus the ultra wide lens. The aperture will range from f2.8 to f5.9, getting narrower as the lens gets more zoomed in. Most zoom lenses will do this. So here, compared to the phones, we're looking at a larger sensor with a smaller aperture. Last up is the Fujifilm with interchangeable lenses. In theory, there's a massive range of focal lengths and apertures that I can choose from but seeing as how some lenses can be upwards of thousands of dollars just for the lens itself, I'm limited to what I own personally. So the lenses I have available to me are the XF 16 to 80 millimeter F4 lens, which is a full frame equivalent of 24 to 122 millimeters. The XF 35 F2, which is a full frame equivalent of about 50 millimeters. And the XC 50 to 230 millimeter, which is the full frame equivalent of about 75 to 350 millimeters, but with a narrow aperture of f4.5 to f6.7. So first, let's go take a look at a landscape. All right, so out here, we're gonna go ahead and try out a landscape. We're gonna try a couple different focal lengths, but we'll go ahead and use the tripod to give it the best possible chance, and we'll go ahead and compare them in a moment. So the way I'll be doing this is showing you the pictures one by one without labels. So you can get a clean view of what these pictures look like. And then after, I'll show you them side by side, and then we'll break it down a little bit. So here are the first four of the landscape. Pause and rewind if you need to. For the landscape, I decided to leave it in complete automatic to see what the cameras think. One of the challenges is that the cameras don't put out the same size photos. So here we have the S21 Ultra, the S6, the Panasonic, and the X-T4. Taking a little bit closer look, the S21 Ultra has a really bright looking image that's very pleasing to the eye. But when you zoom in a little bit, you can see that it is still a phone camera. You get kind of those mushy details. Moving over to the three times camera, you can see more details in the background, but as you zoom in, it has a very watercolor-like look. But lastly here on the S21 Ultra is the 10 times camera, where here you can actually see that it's Six Flags Magic Mountain. Moving back to the past, here's the Galaxy S6, which surprisingly is pretty competitive with the S21 Ultra on the face of it. But of course, you only have one lens, and when you zoom in, you lose all that detail. So what do we get moving to a real camera? Here's the ZS100 from Panasonic, which is a much more subdued looking image, which has a lot to do with how the camera decided to take the photo. 
When we get closer to the photo, we see that the details are more grainy versus the mushy of the phone cameras. Of course, why would you crop in digitally when you can use the optical zoom? Here's the Panasonic with the optical zoom all the way out. Last up is the most expensive, the Fujifilm X-T4. And on the face of it is the darkest and the most subdued of the lot. This camera likes being controlled manually. It really doesn't like automatic modes. But let's see what happens when we zoom in a little bit. This is on the 16 to 80, set to be about equivalent to the other cameras. And here you can see that while it does lose detail when you zoom in, it's a lot more natural looking. But I want to get a better look at the theme park, so let's switch lenses. Here's the 70 to 230, and you can really start to make out the details. Now, the day is kind of hazy, so you're going to lose it just because of the sky. Even so, you can get quite a bit of detail out of this picture. That's quite a drop. Next up, a close-up outdoors. Here's a flower I found in the backyard of my parents' house. Now be careful here, I changed the order of the cameras, so just pay attention to the details. A couple of the things we're looking at here is the detail of the flower itself, the colors, and the background, which is blurred in all of these photos, which is called bokeh, which is a side effect of the aperture and sensor size. Here they all are, side by side. Again, take a look. What do you think? And here it is. How did you do? Mind you, this is all natural bokeh, none of the portrait mode on. Taking a closer look at the Galaxy S6, it's still holding its own very well for such an old phone. And who says you can't get bokeh with a phone sensor? And overall, it's very bright and sharp. Let's take a closer look at the flower itself. Overall, pretty good. The color's a little bit more vibrant in real life, but the details are there if a bit oversharpened. Not bad. Now the Panasonic. I'm not too happy with how this one came out, though part of that's my fault. The composition's not very good. Let's take a little bit closer look at the flower. Here's that one inch sensor going to work. The details are a lot more natural than in the Galaxy S6, and the colors are a lot more true to life. As far as the bokeh, I want to show you something kind of interesting. I'm going to zoom back out, and I'm going to show you a similar composition, but with a little bit more zoom. The last picture was at the widest, here's at the most telephoto, and you'll see that the bokeh is much more pronounced. This is with a much more narrow aperture. So it shows how taking a few steps back and zooming in a little bit can change the composition of the photo. Now here's the Fujifilm with the f2 35mm lens, and you can see the background is completely obliterated, though the composition could still be a little bit better. This really shows the importance of sensor size. Back on the Galaxy S6, that has an f1.8 aperture, and this is an f2, so technically narrower, but having the larger sensor gives you the more dramatic bokeh. As we get a little bit closer, we can see some other things that are going on. A little bit of halo around the white parts, which is just having the wide open aperture and bright sunlight. You'll also notice that some parts of the flower are in focus and other parts are out of focus, which shows how narrow the depth of field is here. Last is the S21 Ultra. Now, this is much more vibrant than it was in real life. That was not the color of the flower. And I'm also seeing some interesting sharpening details, though the bokeh is actually pretty good for a camera phone sensor. Getting in close shows that weird sharpening effect. It's very sharp, but it does look a little artificial. Of course, the main camera isn't the only camera on here. I want to show you a couple other things that are kind of cool. This is the Focus Assist. This uses the ultra-wide lens focused in close onto the object and kind of gives you a macro lens on the camera. You don't get a lot of crop ability since it falls apart a little bit getting close, but it's pretty impressive what you can get. And then using the same trick we did on the Panasonic, here's the 10x telephoto lens. It shows a really interesting bokeh quality. It's kind of striped almost, and the flower looks pretty good. Now let's try out a portrait with some decent lighting, just to find a subject. Ah. Wait, me? Yeah, come on, sit down. Okay. Hat and glasses off. Oh, fine. Better. Now smile. Boy, was this one a mixed bag. Now, mind you, I was doing self-portraits here, so I had to set up the cameras myself and trigger them myself. But the quality difference between these cameras couldn't be more different here. So take a look at these pictures, and I'll show you side by side, and let me know what you think. Here they are all together. I've got some interesting things to look at on here, so let me go ahead and show you what they are. Just a note, this is the same lighting, same location, though I did have to do this as a self-portrait, so I had to do all the settings and take the photos myself. So let's take a closer look at each one. 
So on the Panasonic, it's nice to have the main sensor with an adjustable focal length. I set it to about a 50mm equivalent, which is a nice portrait focal length, and it's kind of flattering to the face. Uh, let's take a little bit closer look at the details. As we get in here, you can see the pores on my face. You can see part of my ear maybe starting to go out of focus, but mostly in focus. And that's mostly to do with the smaller sensor size and narrower aperture than we have on the X-T4. But coming back out, looking at the full image, it is a pretty nice looking portrait. I don't really have uh, a lot more to say about it. And now the S21 Ultra. What happened here? Uh, one thing I'll say is that the S21 Ultra seems to like to overexpose. And another thing I'm going to say is that the main camera is actually really wide for a main camera. You can see my light off to the side coming into the frame. And I'm going to show you something about focal lengths and portraits here in a moment. But first, getting in close, you can see it's still picking up a good amount of detail. I'm really shiny looking here for some reason. Um, but kind of strange looking, and I'll show you why. Here's the three times telephoto that is framed poorly, but you can see my face looks a lot more natural. And that's a side effect of the focal length. The wider angle lenses will give you more distortion. So here it is side by side, still overexposed, but you can see my face looks a lot more natural with the three times telephoto. What's interesting is if you use portrait mode on the phone, it still uses the main sensor, though cropped in a little bit, and you get a fake background blur. So you still get a little bit of that distortion in your portrait photos. So next up is the Galaxy S6. It's really starting to show its age in this test. Everything's in focus. There isn't any blurry background or anything like that. But I will say that the focal length is a lot more flattering than the just slightly wider Galaxy S21 Ultra. I'll also say that this old 16 megapixel sensor is still picking up some pretty good detail. So overall, it's showing its age, but still pretty good for the time. Last is the Fujifilm X-T4. In portrait photography, you really start to see where the money goes in buying a dedicated camera versus using your smartphone. Fujifilm makes it super easy to be able to change settings and make things the way you like without having the futz around into the menus. Taking a closer look shows what you get with some good quality glass and a nice sensor, and the importance of eye autofocus, because you can see the shallow depth of field has my eyes in focus, but my ears are out of focus. I know I'm asking you to form your own opinions here, but I think as far as portraits go, the X-T4 is by far the best. Just a quick side test before I get to the last one. Here's a couple of moon photos, one from each camera. Which one's which? I'll give you a moment. Is it what you thought? And last, let's try some low light, which is really where the phones have been focusing their attention on lately. The subject of this photo is going to be Mario that I've had since a kid. It's back when he had a nice head of hair. Here's a representative sample of the plumbing that he's doing in the dark in the bathroom. So the following is the best I can do handheld. No setting it on a tripod with a three minute shutter. So while taking a look at these, part of what we're looking at is how bright the photo is, how much you can see in it. But the other part is the details. Uh, how much noise is there? How much detail are you getting out of the picture? And just how pleasing is it to you? So take a look at these. I'll put them up side by side and we'll take a look at the details in a moment. So only one of these actually has a night mode. Everything else is just using traditional photography techniques. Aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. Though all of these have some form of image stabilization. Well, there's your answer. Are you surprised? The X-T4 has the advantage of having the largest sensor, so the most area to pick up light. And for this, I use my F2 lens to bring in as much light as I can. Getting in closer, you can see there's still a good amount of detail, even though it's a bit washed out. And there's quite a bit of noise, but not too bad considering that this is 6400 ISO, which is a very high ISO. Next is the ZS100, which did surprisingly well considering it doesn't have a backside illuminated sensor. I think the image stabilization is really helping it out here. But the shortcomings really come to the forefront when you zoom in a little bit. Most of the detail is lost, and there's some very heavy noise in this photo. In the Galaxy S6, it makes me question whether or not it was a good idea to spend time alone in the dark with this thing. I don't really want to zoom in, but let's take a look. You can see that it's all noise and almost no detail. This really shows how far our phones have come. Especially when you look at the Galaxy S21 Ultra handheld in the exact same lighting. 
Now this is using computational photography. This is using night mode. So if you see, when I zoom in, the details have these glitchy looking artifacts that are from the AI trying to figure out what's in those areas because it doesn't have enough information to fill it in. So what did you think of this wholly unscientific comparison? Let me know in the comments below. But until next time, never stop having fun.